Hello everyone, I'm Paris Fox and I'd like to welcome you to 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership with Tom Fox hosted by Richard Lummis. What makes a great leader? Is it genetic or can you learn leadership skills? Join Tom Fox and Richard Lummis in this podcast where they consider leadership from a wide variety of perspectives, academic, behavioral science, history, popular culture, the movies, and much more. You'll learn about specific tactics and strategies that you can bring to your own leadership toolkit. 12 O'Clock High is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, this is Richard Lummis, and I'm here with Tom Fox for another episode of 12 O'Clock High, a podcast about leadership. In these discussions, we draw what we hope are interesting examples from our own experiences, history, business, literature, and politics, to examine what constitutes good leadership and extract lessons we can use to improve our own leadership skills. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you, Richard. We're continuing our series on presidents with the with the fourth of five podcasts covering Theodore Roosevelt. Today, we'll be discussing his life following his presidency. He honored his pledge not to run for more than one term, although, as you pointed out in our last podcast, he was not constitutionally prohibited from, from running. And so he supported William Howard Taft as his replacement, but he rapidly became disenchanted. Uh, immediately following... Um, the election of Taft, Roosevelt disappeared um, to go uh, hunting and touring Europe. And Tom, I think you were you found this particularly interesting. I did, Richard. Uh, part of it is because of my education, and uh, I had a fabulous lecturer, uh, the, I guess professor for uh, American history at the University of Texas named George Forge. And, and I cannot emphasize how great he was, how much he influenced my study and my thinking on history. But he found this phase of Roosevelt's life almost laughable, indeed even beyond parody. Um, and it always struck me and has stuck with me since that time about this uh, big game hunting tour he did in Africa where uh, basically he said a blind Roosevelt would stand with his gun while a guide shot the animal. And uh, in in just the little research we did on this phase of his life, I found that not to be true. Um, Now, he did kill or trap over 11,000 animals. uh, We have to acknowledge that. Uh, But he did so for the Smithsonian, uh, for the New York Museum of Science. Uh, He had scientists with him. He had anthropologists with him. He had botanists. He had uh, um, a large number of uh, people there to collect information. He also had, of course, guides and, and other big game hunters. But the second part of this expedition is what I really wanted to focus on, Richard. And in this second part, he he journeys from Africa to uh, embark on a tour of Europe. He started in Egypt and then from there jumped over to Europe. And he met with Franz Joseph, Kaiser Wilhelm, King George V. Uh, In Oslo, he delivered a speech calling for the limitation on naval armaments, certainly presaging uh, uh, treaties that were signed post World War II. He uh, argued for a permanent court of arbitration along the lines of his arbitration of the Russo Japanese War of 0405. He argued for the creation of a League of Peace among world powers. He um, argued at uh, Oxford, debated at Oxford, I should say. Uh, and this foreign trip, I think, really helped. Uh, established him as one of the great thought leaders that we would say now uh, in American politics, but also with a much more forward outlook, much more foreign outlook. And uh, Roosevelt, I think it informed uh, many of his his views going forward. And it goes back to a theme that uh, we have had talked about many times uh, over this podcast series on Roosevelt of a lifelong learner. And you were quick to point out absolutely correctly that it was not just book learning. Uh, It was studying. It was talking to others. It was doing investigations. It was going to sites on his own. You mentioned his uh, and the Civil Service Commission when he had hearings in Milwaukee. Uh, uh, Nobody has hearings in Milwaukee and certainly not (laughs) in the late 1890s. Uh, Sorry, I have a Sorry, Flan, for that slide on your hometown Um, or any of our other fans from Milwaukee. But nobody went to Milwaukee. Um, 
but he he did and he and this is just one more example of a massive learning experience that Roosevelt uh engaged in and and when you couple that with the the big game hunting expedition whatever uh we may think of big game hunting now and how it's so far fallen from favor uh that in many ways was a learning experience for him too and it, it points out uh to me that uh consumption of information never ends if you if you choose uh not to and it can make you a better leader a better person a better presidential candidate or a better something i found i found the uh, his european tour quite interesting too he was um he attended the funeral of edward the 7th and that's when he met uh, george the 5th but apparently his his role there was was an interesting one because he was not the ambassador to the court of st james he was, simply happened to be there at the time but all the, all of these kings wanted to talk to him. Um, I think that that says a great deal about his uh, charisma and just his his general fascination um, to a lot of people. Which probably part of that was his career as a cowboy and as a rough rider. But uh, but it, it was very interesting how how uh, happily received he was by the by the crowned heads of Europe. So, Richard, then we move to, uh, you mentioned this, uh, the schism between himself and Taft and how that led to the uh, 1912 convention in the Bull Moose Party. What uh, what did you see in that phase of his career? Well, I think a lot of his disenchantment with Taft was related to uh, Taft being a lawyer and a very careful lawyer. And, of course, he subsequently uh, became uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court. Um but during his term, there were a number of court decisions that uh, basically stopped a lot of the progressive or, or overturned a lot of progressive policies. And I think um, to Roosevelt, it was, a, it was a contest between legalism and justice. And in this case, both, both Taft and Roosevelt's friend, uh, Elihu Root, were really lawyers to the core. In fact, he once said Elihu Root was seven-eighths lawyers and one-eighth man. Um, but um, the issue of the ability of people to vote to overturn judicial decisions was one that he um, brought up in the run-up to this election. And uh, it's not one that I was aware of, but uh, it's, as a recovering attorney myself, I find it appalling. Um you know, leading to the tyranny of the majority and all that. But uh, but Roosevelt felt very strongly, and in the context of the time, battling the entrenched forces of conservatism, um, it, it, his uh, rule may, may have made some sense. Um, unusually, uh, both uh, Robert La Follette, the uh, uh, progressive uh, candidate, and Roosevelt opted to uh, run against Taft, the incumbent president. Um, Roosevelt also uh, began to campaign in person, which was a, a, a break with tradition. And uh, the campaign was was vicious and personal. Um, they, they insulted a lot of each other, uh, each other a lot. The um, Some of the terms are, are really quite humorous. Uh, but ultimately, I find this uh, puzzling aspect of his personality. Um, Root, who knew him quite well, said that believed that it was because uh, his characteristic was that he was essentially a fighter, and when he gets into a fight, he becomes completely dominated by the desire to destroy his adversary. And I think once he viewed Taft as an adversary, he, he fell into that. Um, one of the other things about this election that I thought was so fascinating was I had always thought that the the use of primaries did not come up until the 70s. But in this election, several states um, used a primary system to nominate their delegates, and Roosevelt run, won most of them by a significant margin, which showed the divergence between popular enthusiasm for him and the enthusiasm of the party leaders to maintain their own uh, positions. He broke a lot of friendships by his decision to uh, to contest the election, including both Root and uh, and Henry Cabot Lodge. Um, the the actual convention involves a lot of sort of inside baseball stuff, but um, eventually Taft was the nominee. Um, 
And uh, everyone knew at the time that he was a losing candidate. And the only way I can really explain that is that local and state politics matter, too. And um, for a lot of the, uh, the delegates to the convention, loyalty to the party uh, would supersede um, winning this particular election. Roosevelt was a, was a very poor loser. Um, I think rage and revenge were his uh, motivations. Um, and in fact, the night after Taft was elected, he spoke at a large uh, meeting that basically founded the the Bull Moose Party. Rich, we had um, one of uh, an incident in the campaign, and I think um, it were as a bears mentioning. And whether this is luck, whether it's something else, it's the assassination attempt. And well, you know, you you said earlier that uh, nobody goes to Milwaukee. And uh, <laughs> perhaps there is, um, you know, Roosevelt, I guess, showed his usual energy during this campaign. He crisscrossed the entire country making speeches. Um, the the platform of the Bull Moose Party, which is, I guess technically it's called the Progressive Party, um, but everyone called it the Bull Moose Party, um, was, was a bit of a, a compromise platform because – one of Roosevelt's big uh, financial backers was a man named Perkins, who was a former J.P. Morgan uh, partner. Um, and basically, there was a contest between the uh, the economic elite who backed Roosevelt and some of the true believers, including Gifford Pinchot, um, who, who were the true progressives. Anyway, um, so Roosevelt goes to Milwaukee to make a speech. Um, he's riding in an open car. And a man named John Schrank, who believed that the ghost of William McKinley uh, had called on him to uh, kill Roosevelt, shot him in the chest uh, with a thirty eight. Uh, the bullet went through his overcoat, his folded 50-page speech, spectacle case, suspenders, shirt, and undershirt, and it still cracked a rib. Um, and um, he insisted on making the speech. He refused to go to the hospital, talked for 80 minutes, and eventually went to the hospital um, they decided not to remove the bullet, which after Garfield's experience was probably a good call. Uh, Shrank himself was found not guilty by reason of insanity and institutionalized until his death in 1943. Um, but yeah, I think that was a fascinating little interlude in his life. And that led to one of the great, um, elections in U S history, that of 1912. And as you foreshadowed, Richard, uh, it was a wipeout for the Republicans and the Bull Moose. Although uh, Woodrow Wilson, the Democratic candidate, only held uh, 42% of the popular vote, and I believe Roosevelt had 27% and Taft some 23%, the Electoral College uh, swung in a landslide of 435 to to Wilson, 87 or 88 to Roosevelt, and or 83 to Roosevelt, and 8 to Taft. Um, so a massive landslide. Uh, Republicans uh, are wiped out in both houses of Congress. This leads to many of the finally some of the or some of the many progressive reforms that had literally been percolating for 20 years uh, were enacted in the first term of Woodrow Wilson. But the um, uh, it's hard to uh, really recreate. Uh, the antipathy of Taft and Roosevelt towards each other. And, um, may, uh, you know, we had Ross Perot, who I think largely led to the defeat of uh, George Bush the Elder after his first term, leading to the uh, win of Bill Clinton. Um, I'm not sure I saw the antip- level of antipathy in that race that we saw in our research for the 1912 presidential election. But there were some still, uh, I think, some important leadership lessons. Um, Once again, uh, leaders are learners uh, from the leadership blog and then from Doris Kearns Goodwin. Don't be afraid to make some unpopular decisions. And you're absolutely right. His decision to run was very unpopular with a certain uh, coterie of the Republican Party and and literally destroyed the Republican Party for the next uh, eight years. But... um, he made that decision. And then once again, when, when you get new information, uh, you can make a, a, 
a change in your decision. Uh, so we saw that as well, once again, coming from uh, the blog post leadership hacks. Any uh, other leadership lessons that really struck you from this phase of Roosevelt's career? Well, uh, yeah, the um, one would be the, the importance of, of personality. You know, uh, Wilson was really a minority president uh, in that he only got 41 or almost 42 percent of the popular vote. Um, Eugene Debs got over a million votes for the Socialist Party um, while in prison. But I guess uh, the other thing that really struck me in the, at this phase in his career is the danger of emotion um, driving you. Um, I think once he got into this fight, he, he became blinded. Um, to to the damage he was he was doing, um, he had basically devoted his life to the Republican Party, and then he bolted them um, uh, simply out of personal antipathy for for Taft, I think, and and led to the presidency of Woodrow Wilson, which uh, we'll we'll be discussing in a subsequent podcast. But it was certainly not necessarily the greatest thing for the country. And then, of course, there's there's the issue of succession. Um, it turned, you know, he had stepped aside for Taft, but it turned out he, like many people, was unable to actually give up the limelight. And um, I, I think that's another important lesson for us all, that there there is a time when you should probably step aside and leave. Um, on that note, I guess our next podcast will be discussing uh, his life um, post Bull Moose. And we hope you'll join us at that time. Uh, for now, this is Richard Lummis and Tom Fox with 12 O'Clock High. This is Tom Fox. I hope you enjoyed this part one of our five-part podcast series on leadership lessons from Theodore Roosevelt. I hope you'll join Richard and I through the month of July on this special series on 12 O'Clock High. 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership, is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. We are also a proud member of C-Suite Radio. I hope you'll join us again. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to visiting with you next week on the Leadership Lessons from Theodore Roosevelt.